Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Realignment. You are tuning in for the season premiere of the show on today, August 19th. As you can tell, I'm on the road right now, but we are continuing to put out really great stuff. Huge thank you to everyone who gave us a bit of a break and to all of you commenters who firmly suggested I should not experiment with green cricket-shaped rowing blazers rugbies we have learned an important <laughs> lesson i'm going back to apollo sagers in his classic supreme shirt we're getting back to basics here sagar who back are we to talking basics. to today yeah we've got lieutenant general dan boulder he's a retired army general he wrote an incredible book years ago called why we lost about the wars in iraq and afghanistan and since he's been consistent for so long we thought he's the perfect person you guys can hear from general boulder gives probably the best articulation of the actual how did we get here you have to go all the way back to 1975 saigon actually which you've probably heard a lot about and by doing that we're going to take you step by step in this episode through every single thing that went wrong um that building up to the fall of kabul that we all just saw last week i think it's incredibly valuable for anybody this is a huge episode for us because we wanted to do an episode on Afghanistan that wasn't just about this specific tactical thing happened or this specific thing didn't happen. This is looking at the bigger picture, how we got there. Sagar said it really well. Let's get into the episode. Dan Bolger, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you. Thanks, Marshall. We were wondering who to record an episode with to really unpack the broader strategic and military picture around what's happening in Afghanistan and obviously the broader war on terror that that intervention has to be considered under. And you immediately came to mind specifically because a little over five years ago, actually more than five years ago, my timeline is a little warped, you wrote a book called Why We Lost about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars specifically. But you made that claim years in the past, which was far, far before we had finished the campaign against ISIS in Iraq. That's before we had the withdrawal we had last weekend. So let's just start here. Why in 2014 were you as retired Lieutenant General comfortable stating we had lost both of these conflicts? Well, um, Marshall, I, I completed my military service in June of 2013. And the last job I had, although I did two tours in Iraq and commanded troops, my last job was um, in command of the NATO training mission in Afghanistan for about a year and a half from 2011 into 2013. So that was my last job, got out, been in 35 years. And I just knew that what we were doing in both countries was not working. Um, it, it was obvious to me um, you know, I've read, studied history. I was a little too young for the Vietnam War, but all the sergeants and officers who trained me when I came in the Army in the late 70s were all Vietnam veterans. And so one of the things they beat into my head and that, that generation, people that people would still know, like, like General Colin Powell from that era, the late General Norman Schwarzkopf, those Vietnam veterans, and they were the guys who trained me, guys like that. Schwarzkopf was my old division commander at one point when I was at Fort Stewart. They beat in my head, hey, don't repeat the mistake we made in Vietnam. Whatever else happens, don't get involved in an irregular war where the people there are quite different than Americans and they don't want us there. Um, You know, it's one thing to go in and make a raid. It's another thing going to make an airstrike or a drone strike or something like that. But going in on the ground and trying to rearrange another society, eh, not a good idea. And, And when guys like General Powell say that or the late General Schwarzkopf, you know, our own history tells us that, you know, how did we like it when people in London, King George III and his ministers were trying to tell us what to do? No, we didn't like it at all. And we didn't like having red coated British troops stationed in our cities and marching through our streets and and shooting us because we gathered at a time they said we shouldn't. You know, we fought a revolution over that. So I don't know what would make us think, especially after getting badly burned in Vietnam. And you could argue, OK, well, that was part of a Cold War against communism and things like that. Why we would think that the right answer to a terrorist attack on 9-11 was to go into two countries quite different than America with different cultures, different values, different civilizational history and try and rearrange them and and try and do it sort of at the point of the gun. Listen, 
social work out of the barrel of a gun is a bad proposition. General, I'm, I'm really curious for this because you are actually of that timeline where, as you said, let's go back to 1975, Saigon. Um, I did a whole thing today on what I think the real lessons of Saigon are, but I've studied enough military history to know that it had a searing effect and that there was a decision within the United States military. Never again. We shove the counterinsurgency manuals and all that stuff. We want to not even be equipped to fight this type of war because this is not what we're all about. So given your experience coming up within that culture, how did we get to a point of 2002, 2003, but then even more importantly, in my view, suddenly it's 2012 and all of the lessons seem to be have completely out the door. Can you give us maybe an oral history of sure, the culture I, of the United States military yeah, and then great, where the turning points where everything went wrong? Great question. Great frame. I'll tell you where, where things went wrong. And it comes from what usually gets people in trouble. And that's um, that's a little too much pride. You know, <laughs> you can go back to all our religions. They always warn you that pride is the underwriting, underweening sin that gets everybody in trouble. Well, the U.S. military is pretty proud of itself. And I think rightly so. Uh, we had we had come back from a pretty low point in Vietnam. We, we re-energized ourselves as a volunteer force. We regained the respect of the American people. And we sure didn't have that when I came into service in, in the 70s, you know, where the military was respected and, and people thought well of it. We were able to complete the Cold War. And if you remember, after Vietnam, we were very, very careful about how and where we used military force. So you and I can remember, you read about it, know about it. I mean, I remember from, from when it happened. We did occasionally put the military in. We do airstrikes. We might invade a small country like like Panama or Grenada, but it was quick. Um, it was very um, short, short operation, very decisive, and then we were out. So then this, our great adversary, the Soviet Union, collapses. And by the way, their collapse was also rapid and unexpected. There's sort of a pattern here. We, we have a very expensive and highly trained intelligence community, but they get things wrong because they're dealing with people. I mean, we we accept that in our daily life that we're going to guess wrong, right. and, you know, go out and forget our umbrella and it rains on us, you know. But um, but in international things, that can happen, too. And the intel community was stunned when the Soviets, who in retrospect were given every indication their economy was falling apart, political reform was not working under Mikhail Gorbachev. Nevertheless, they go under very, very quickly at the end of 1991 after losing control of Eastern Europe over the previous two years. Um, might add, by the way, that one of the precipitating cause of that was their 10-year effort in Afghanistan. That should yes. have been a warning right there. The British had been in there three times, and it didn't help them during the area of the Empire and British Raj. So now it's 91. And what happened coincidentally that year? The United States, for the first time since Vietnam, with a bunch of allies, committed a major ground force to the Middle East and, and waged a successful limited war to liberate Kuwait, which had been overrun by the Iraqis under Saddam Hussein. That war was, was wildly successful, way more than anybody in it. When you go back and read what was predicted, again, those Vietnam veterans, General Colin Powell, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, General Norman Schwarzkopf, our field commander there. Those people were thinking, hey, we're going to lose 25,000 troops in this operation. We're going to lose a bunch of aircraft. We're going to lose ships. You know, why? Because they sort of did the numbers and they said, hey, you know, this guy Saddam, his forces have been fighting the Iranians for eight years. You know, this is going to be a cakewalk. Well, we were pleasantly surprised. I mean, obviously, people were killed on both sides, but it, it was a much quicker and more decisive war than we thought. Right. And here comes the pride. So we, the Soviets, our, ally, our, our great adversaries have collapsed. You know, we win the Cold War after 46 years of, of holding the line and struggle and mistakes in places like Korea and Bay of Pigs and Vietnam. But, but nevertheless, we hold out, we win. So our strategy had worked of containment. And now we've had this smashing success in the Middle East, a place we'd always, we had treated it like it had cooties. We did not want to go into the Middle East, especially on the ground. You know, our our view there was use allies, use folks like the Saudi Arabians, the Iranians before they sort of went radical, the, the Israelis, the Egyptians, anybody but American troops on the ground there. And yet we'd done it and we pulled it off. And then we began to do a series of other interventions. We sent troops into Somalia. Most people would remember the Black Hawk Down episode. That didn't go too well. But the lesson we learned from that, if you ask Americans what they know about the Somali intervention in the early 90s, 
they remember the book of the movie Black Hawk Down. It's it's some kind of, you know, it's a Saturday afternoon matinee where our people are heroic and all that. Hey, the operation failed. All right. Mm. You know, I mean, yes, there was a lot of hero- heroism, but a warning was missed there. Instead, we go then into Haiti in an intervention. And, you know, that's that's a country the United States has intervened in before. That one gets a UN OK and sort of kind of works. And we're able to pull out after about 18 months. We go into the Balkans eventually after a brutal civil war there that our European allies were pleading for us to come in. Finally, in 95, we go into Bosnia. 99, we go into Kosovo. And the war settles down. We think it's because, well, the Americans have showed up and now we've settled this. I think in retrospect, we could see that the people there just killed themselves to the point where they couldn't take it anymore. The war had been so brutal for so many years with so many genocidal lineups of families and things like that. The people in the Balkans had had it. Anybody could have come in there. I mean, any country on earth, you know, the United Forces of Antarctica or something, and it would have ended because the people there wanted it to end. But we thought it was us. So when 9-11 happens, and the U.S. president at that time, George W. Bush, turns to his military and says, and remember, General Colin Powell's sitting there now as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, not as chairman anymore, but now he's the Secretary Secretary of State. State. Yeah. They have the meeting after 9-11, what should we do? And a military response is proposed. It's noteworthy that Powell was the only guy, the only guy. You had Vice President Cheney, you had various other people, you had the chairman, all these others saying, we can do this, we can get in, we can, we can knock out the Taliban, we can get Al-Qaeda. We had, we had no ability to hunt down Al-Qaeda. Again, back to our movies that we watch, one of the points of Black Hawk Down was we couldn't find the guy we were looking for. That's how come the Black Hawk gets shot down, you know? I mean, this is very tricky to go manhunting in a foreign country. And we had no such capability at that time. The drones that we use now were just in their infancy. The CIA had been experimenting on the side. And of course, our U.S. Air Force, not surprisingly, in 2001 said, we don't want a plane with no pilot in it. That's not our thing, you know? So so instead, we come up with a war and then we, we are, again, you know, Americans, we're optimistic. We go into Afghanistan. We go in there in the fall during the crappy weather. We run the Taliban out. We sort of see the same phenomenon we've just seen over the last few weeks where the Afghans are, they're good fighters individually. And they are, they're all about sort of bushwhacking and stuff, but standing up to airstrikes or standing up to form troops, eh, not their thing. And so what happened was the Taliban began to put their finger in the air. They realized, Hey, these Americans got the planes they are going to win. And people just switched sides. There was, there was only a little fighting just as there was in this most recent Taliban offensive, only a little actual shooting. Mostly it was people just saying, Hey, I want to get on the winning side of this or get the heck out of it, get away from it. And so we swiftly took over Afghanistan with no idea of what to do next because we didn't expect a quick victory. You know, we expected sort of, you know, airstrikes, shooting guys, you know, and all that. And unlike Somalia, where we pulled out immediately, unlike Haiti, where we were able to get the United Nations involved and get out, unlike the Balkans that settled down, Afghanistan didn't settle down. And it was sort of low level. I mean, the Taliban, no, no Taliban wanted to be the first guy to stick his head up and get a smart bomb on it. But they kept their operation going. They got across the Pakistan border. Horrible terrain there, the Hindu Kush mountains. And there they are. And they're sort of percolating in the background. Again, arrogance, lack of humility, thinking we can do everything, pride. So when the president says, hey, it's a global war on terrorism, we don't want any more terrorist groups. What about this Saddam Hussein guy? Well, the military had a plan to fight there going all the way back to 1990-91. We had liberated Kuwait, but we never knocked out Saddam Hussein. We'd blockaded the country by sea and air for 10 years during the 90s. Americans forget that because we weren't the they ones getting blockaded, that. but Iraqis right. had were cut off from all international trade. Their oil couldn't be exported. People were not in good shape. The Iraqi economy fell apart. And it wasn't that great to begin with. But you know, when you're an oil economy, you can't export oil, you're, you're hurting. And we were daily dropping bombs and shooting smart missiles and all this in during the 90s. So the idea of the Pentagon and, and, you know, guys like me, that's about when I became a general was, hey, let's clean up our mess that we have with this guy Saddam. He can't fight that well. His troops, we saw in 91, they stink. We'll roll right over them and it'll be over. And 
And in the words of uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, they will greet us with flowers and stuff like that, just sort of like the liberation of Paris in 1944 by the U.S. Army. Well, didn't go anything like that. Again, the people there definitely didn't like Saddam in Iraq, but they wanted us out. And now you've got the United States bogged down with troops in Afghanistan, troops in Iraq, no idea what to do next other than keep hanging around. That was the environment I was in when I served in both countries. And that's what caused me to write that book and to put that title on it, because I knew this thing was going in the wrong direction. The United States was not going to stay in these countries for 100 years. And as soon as we decided to pull out of either of them, the roof would cave in yeah. because the average person in those countries wanted nothing to do with Americans. You've, you've just suggested American something. American soldiers pointing a weapon at them. You suggested something really, really interesting, which is let's define what victory looks like. Because in the story you've told, there's a way of arguing that in some ways we won, other ways we lost. So most obvious way, Osama bin Laden is dead. He sure. did not achieve his objective of causing the U.S. to collapse much in the way that the Soviet Union did. You can say all you want about the various disasters of the Afghan occupation. Our country still exists. NATO still exists. The U.S. is still successful as a country in the sense that after 1975, you could say all these terrible things about the U.S. global world presence, yet 15 years later, you have that presence in Desert Storm, obviously. So my question for you then is, what exactly do you find a loss, define a loss as? Because it seems that you just said a loss was the fact that we can't stay in these countries forever. They're going to collapse. But going back to 2001, the objective initially was not let's reconstitute a democratic government in Iraq. It wasn't let's constitute a democratic government in Afghanistan. So just help us understand winning and losing sure, in these right. weird irregular wars. Because by the way, you, you said this earlier, I want you to define a regular war for our listeners because that really gets to the nuance we're trying sure. to get to. Okay, so we'll start with getting our terms straight. Regular versus irregular war. Everybody knows what regular war is. It's what you play on Call of Duty. It's, it's what you see when you go to a movie like Saving Private Ryan. Both sides line up and wear uniforms. You know, World War II, you know, Iwo Jima, the Japanese are wearing brown uniforms. The Marines are wearing green uniforms. Everybody's got, you know, fighting in, in a style and a disciplined manner with a clear chain of command. And by and large, the civilian population is off the battlefield. They've been evacuated. Maybe they've been killed by pre-attack bombardment. But, but the, the, the local population is not part of the issue. So for most of us, regular warfare is what we think of when we get an image in our head of war, of weapons, discipline, leadership, all that kind of stuff. You know, we see the U.S. Army marching down the street on 4th of July in our hometown, the National Guard or something. That's what we're thinking of, that kind of war. Irregular war is, in some ways, the antidote to regular war. If you're a poor country, and there's no way that you can field a bunch of tanks and B-52s and submarines and all this other stuff, you say, well, what can I do? Well, what I can do is I can mix in with the population. I can wear the same clothes they're wearing. I keep my AK-47 under my cot, and I only pull it out at night when I need it. I use weapons that I can make in my backyard from, from fertilizer and from gasoline and things like that. And my goal is not necessary to beat these Americans in a stand or British or whoever you're talking about in a stand up fight is to wear them out in a protracted war. And again, U.S. history, we do know something about this. This was the way we fought the first half of our American Revolution. You know, we love George Washington and all these guys, Alexander Hamilton. They made the, the musical about him. And it's great. And Hamilton was a very brave soldier in the war. But. What we forget sometimes as Americans, maybe we don't like to think about this, we got, we got our butts kicked in every major battle by the British till the French showed up. Yes, the French bailed us out of the war. And they bailed us out not because they loved American liberty, far from it, but because they hated the British. It was done for big power politics of the year. Nevertheless, we benefit from it. But much of our war effort consisted of guys who weren't in a uniform, who took a squirrel rifle off their, their fireplace and went out and sniped at British. You know, it was, it was very much a sort of insurgent terrorist war. 
That's irregular war. The Minuteman, the Bushwhacker, the, the guerrilla. Guerrilla comes from the Spanish word for little war. When the uh, French went into Spain and they defeated the Spanish regular army, but the Spanish population took their weapons and fought back. And so that's regular and irregular war. So then victory, you say, okay, well, great. You got all these terms laid out. How do I know if I won? Historically, there's always two indications of victory, two indications of victory. And if you get both of them, you know you won the war. If you get one, then you can argue about it. So here's what they are. First one is one that we don't like to talk about, but frankly, we do all the time. And that's how many people on each side got killed in the war or in the battle or in the engagement or whatever. In other words, if I lose 10 and you lose 20, I've won in that component. But there's a second component as well, because I would I would tell you in the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the numbers, brutal though they are, are very much in our favor. I mean, sadly, though, we've lost about over 6000 people in both countries. We have probably killed five to 10 times that number of, of terrorists. OK, but there's another component. And that's known to, to use the oldest term going all the way back to pre, to early historic times in Sumerian stuff like that is who holds the field, who holds the ground. In other words, when the dust settles and you've counted up the dead on each side and all that, who's left there with their flag raised over that town? So in Afghanistan today, that would be the Taliban, all right? You know, we saw over the weekend, our ambassador and our team at the embassy literally lowered the American flag. And yes, we've still got troops there doing an evacuation, but we're out of there. You know, our effort is over. The government we supported is gone, the Republic of Afghanistan, they're gone. And there's a Taliban emirate now in, in place there. So those two things you look at for victory. And, and as you, you all both know, and, and I think we should understand, you often get a split decision. So you get this situation where America, like you said, Marshall, Americans would say, hey, we prevented a terrorist, big terrorist attack since 9-11. We killed bin Laden. We killed all these terrorists. There's Al Qaeda guys, these ISIS guys, these ISIS K guys in, in Afghanistan. Yes, that's true, but you didn't hold the ground. And I know, admittedly, we still have troops in Iraq, but our current president's already announced they're going to be pulled out also. So, I mean, that thing is going to wrap up within the next few months, too. Now, that may get relooked and based on what happened this weekend. Who knows? Mm. Here's, here's the quick follow up because it's incredibly important. I really appreciate the way you define this because. Sagar and I are both really frustrated about broader implications folks who don't have the deep military experience that you have are taking from this conflict. And because what I'm kind of getting at is what does the loss in Afghanistan say about our broader armed forces? So to give an example of what I'm talking about, you will see folks saying things like the U.S. has lost in Afghanistan, the U.S. couldn't hold on to Iraq. The U.S. is now permanently in decline. There's a big, broader contention one could make. But I think, and this is very important if you read your book, you start off the book by talking about then-Captain H.R. McMaster right. leading one of the most successful tank engagements in world history during Desert Storm. So this is a general who, in one context, a regular war, as you're describing, tank against tank, mano a mano, last man standing wins – utterly eviscerates the Iraqis. It's just complete and total victory. But you then take that same general, those same troops, age them up 20, 30 years, they put them in this Afghan context, and they can't win a war. So what I want to know from you is, how should we think about the ability of our militaries to win wars in this context? Because there is just this rhetoric around, we can't win wars since World War II. Does this say something about our nation? And what I would put forward is, we've always been terrible at irregular warfare. The British were terrible at irregular warfare in the American context, right? The British lose the Revolutionary War, but the empire doesn't peak for another 120 years. So I would just love for you to respond to how we should think about the differences between these two styles of war and how that affects our own politics. Yeah, I think uh, here I would go back to obviously one of the greatest thinkers in history, Adam Smith, you know, the, the guy who defined capitalism, you know, his his comment in 1778 is the American war is going badly for the British, where he says there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. And what did he mean by that? He's talking about his own country, Great Britain. But what it means is if you're truly a great power, you can afford to stumble in an inconsequential event. 
World War I or World War II, we could not have afforded to lose those wars. If we lost those wars, all three of us may not be here or we'd be living very different lives if we were under Nazi control or something like that, quite different. Um, sadly, some of these other interventions are the type that they're not essential to our life. Now, the scary part here is, yes, they're not essential to the American life. In other words, our failure in Vietnam, we surmounted that because it was, a, it was turned out to be a strategically peripheral era, area. We kept our eye on the ball deterring the Soviet Union. You know, the Soviets were never emboldened to try a nuclear strike or invasion of Europe. You know, I think today people are saying, oh, with this, the Chinese will be attacking Taiwan. I doubt it. All right. They <laughs> might you. do it for their yes. own reasons when they do it, but whatever happened in Kabul won't, won't know it. Remember, I talked about those two aspects of, of victory. And I told you when you get a split decision, people can argue either way. What I, and I have no knowledge of what Vivi Putin or Xi Jinping and their people are doing today. But looking at their history, knowing a little about both guys and knowing how their countries work, what they see is they see an American military that's very capable of killing people and blowing things up. We're real good at that. But that's irrelevant. I mean, it's like it's like being in a football game and winning the, the, the yardage, but you don't win the score. You don't ever put it in the end zone. You go up and down between the 20s. So what? That's, that's what we've done. Our problem in America is more strategy problem than the tactics or the fighting. H.R. McMaster, Dan Bolger, any of these people you pick, we're good at the hooking and jabbing stuff. We're not good at the strategy level. And part of some of the challenge, going back to old Adam Smith and dealing with the British, when you get to the policy level, it's not, nor should it be, strictly people in uniform. You bring in political people, you bring in diplomats, you bring in intelligence folks, you bring in thinkers, folks like, you, you know, Sog, you and Marshall, get, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, it might not happen to you yet, but it will. You'll get asked to join an administration and do some work and do, I mean, maybe you're already doing some consulting for them. So they bring all you in too. I mean, I, nobody I work with in the U.S. government came to work in the morning and said, how can I screw this war up? All right. They were all trying to do it right. But the problem is, some things are just not solvable by an external force. You know, you know, to give you an example, it is solvable to eventually track down Osama bin Laden and kill him. It may take right. 10 years like it did, but you can do that, right? It's not solvable to, quote, change the environment of South Asia so that you'd never again have a bin Laden who could live. It can't be done. We mentioned the British a couple of times. I mean, greatest empire the world's ever seen. Even they realized they could not change the cultures of the countries they went into, including ours. And we so in the United States probably, because of our immigration patterns, had more in common with, with England than most others. Right. You know, when the British went into South Asia, yeah, great. They taught folks English. They did all that. But the fundamental civilization there was much more powerful than a few tens of thousands of guys in red coats. You Let's know, talk about that. There's limits. That's what we have to realize. Let's talk about then your own personal experience in the war in Afghanistan and give us an oral history of the war itself. So you've already started off and with Taliban, we, you know, I've, I've said this publicly, I think the greatest mistake that the Bush administration made is not throwing everything we had at the battle of Tora Bora and trying to kill bin Laden because I mean, I'm Quite curious right. for your, for your view on this. Yes, I think a lot of people would have died, but that would have actually fulfilled the mission, and then we could have gotten the hell out of there. So tell us the explicit like tactical decisions that were made by the Bush administration, the Obama administration, but also in the army, which transitioned from, okay, now we're going to kill bin Laden. Well, I actually can't find him anymore, so now we're backing this guy named Karzai, and then we're transitioning to democracy, and also, oh wait, now the Taliban are rising again and we have to we have to tamp that down. So folks like yourself go up and surge, but now that's over. And now it's all about assisting the government and propping them up. These are all wild decisions that were made, you know, within the concourse of 20 years. So could you live, like, you know, you lived it. Ex sure. Tell it a little bit to the audience, explain it to them. Because many of the people who listen to this podcast, oh, I'm 29, so I barely remember you know, it was like nine years old, 9-11. So 
Some of the right. people listening to this podcast are 18, 19. They weren't even alive. Um, they don't even know why we're in Afghanistan. And I, I was explaining the conflict to somebody yesterday, and they were like, oh, yeah. They're like, what was the deal with bin Laden? They were like 10 when bin Laden was killed. So just give us the, uh, sure. the history of that, if you will. Well, I think, I think Sag, you, you raised yeah. several really important issues that we, that we can talk about. So I show up in Afghanistan. It's 2011. What's the situation there? Keep in mind that the United States goes into Afghanistan in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 to get bin Laden, as you said. You mentioned the fighting at Tora Bora. I've been to Tora Bora, the White Mountains. I've been to that area. I've seen the cave, done all that stuff, done operations down there. Because it's it's a big area that the uh, the Taliban continue to use because it's a great place to hide. It's hard to get them. Um, when that battle occurred in December of 2001, we run the Taliban out of the major cities. This is like bin Laden's last stand, and he's down in this Tora Bora mountain range, which is right on the border with Pakistan. And I think, you know, when we talk border in the United States, people think of the crossing down at El Paso or up near Niagara Falls. No, I mean, there's no markings. There's nothing. I mean, it, to you or I, if we if we walk up there or fly over the plane, the only reason we're on one side of the border or the other is the GPS tells us, because you can't even tell from a map or mm -hmm. from looking. There's no markings. So um, in this area around right the border, we get Bin Laden. We think he's there. We're pretty sure he's there. And we, we later confirmed that he was. But the problem is all we got are special forces. And, and people should realize, again, we all play Call of Duty or we watch, you know, SEAL Team TV show or whatever. When you're talking special forces, you're talking a dozen or so guys, a very small number of people. So great shooters, real smart men and women. I mean, the best people we've got in uniform as far as their capabilities but if your job is to sort of spread out and do a snipe hunt and find this guy, it's pretty darn hard to do that with 12 guys. And so the hundreds of guys that we were working with were all Afghans. Well, you know, the Afghan, it's December, it's cold. They want to eat. They want, you know, they've been fighting since the Soviets invaded in 1979. Bin Laden's not their problem. He never attacked right. them. So, you know, they're willing to cut a deal. They're willing to do this. And that. So you got our 12 guys trying to encourage them and they got a radio and they're calling in airstrikes. And you said we should have poured in every troop we had. The problem was the number of troops we had in Afghanistan at that time was very, very small. We had a, a, a small Marine force, a couple thousand guys near Kandahar, which is quite a ways away. It's on the southwest side of the country, the mountains of Tora Bora, southeast side. And then we had these smatterings of special forces that all together might add it up to 500 guys. And we had a lot of airplanes. And we, we didn't know exactly which radio call was bin Laden, you know, which, which, which little bleep that was coming in talking in Pashto or Arabic was him talking on the, on the phone and not just some other guy. Because you're just getting signals. You're not really getting, you know, I, I know on TV, on, you know, like NCIS, they can always track them right down to the warehouse. But it ain't, it ain't like that in real life. And it sure wasn't like that in 2001. So we missed that opportunity. He got away. He got across the border, began to reconstitute. The Taliban, a lot of their leaders got away. And remember, most of the Taliban never left Afghanistan. They just went back to being villagers and waited for the day when they'd be relieved. So you say, run, run the thing ahead. So what happens is we sort of lose interest in Afghanistan. Yeah, we knocked, we beat them up. We took over the government. We put in this Karzai guy, Hamid Karzai was installed. NATO has somewhat taken charge of it. And so we sort of say, OK, we got that under control. It's not too bad. Bin Laden, we don't know where he is, but he's not in Afghanistan. Now this Iraq thing. So Iraq was very much the war we wanted. And, it, you know, in retrospect, people beat up George W. Bush. How could you go into Iraq? Everybody wanted to go into Iraq. Go look at the vote for that 2003 war. That vote yeah. is taken in October 02, right before the off-year election. It was a more decisive bipartisan vote than the one for the 91 war. Way more. I mean, and that, which is crazy upon reflection. Yeah, in terms which is of literally the, insane. You know? <laughs> well, it's crazy because a lot of those people who voted yes later said, "Whoa, I didn't agree with that." I mean, right. and I included in that our our most previous president, who said, "Oh, I was always against." His. Go back and look at his statements. Now, again, they made him on the Howard Stern show, not the state, sure. not the uh, floor of the Senate. But the but the point is, American sentiment, as reflected by our elected officials, and you can always tell with our elected officials, when you're really getting them reflecting the voice of the public, like a month before they, they go to the voting booth. They're, you're gonna definitely hear, that John and Jane Q public are gonna hear what they wanna hear at that point. Uh, why do I mention that? Because great consensus to go into Iraq and quote, finish the job. 
fear that Saddam had had nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. And he had residual chunks of those things, but the whole country was a mess. The year of uh, the 10 years of blockade and all that, Iraq was a basket case. And they did not put up much of a conventional war. They were easily crushed. But the problem is, and we've got this thing percolating in Afghanistan that we haven't cleared, cleaned up. Now we've got a thing percolating in Iraq. The average person in Iraq did not want foreigners staying there. Iraq had an issue that went back. They could remember when the Turks ruled them, they hated that. They absolutely hated the British mandate after World War I. They fought a major insurrection against them. You know, the Iraqi people are just like you and me. They, you know, would we like a foreign army living in our country, driving? I mean, right. just even if they're relatively well disciplined, like the American military is, they're still, you still got their tanks driving all over the place, the helicopters flying overhead and, you know, causing your chickens to drop eggs and all this. You know, that's besides any fight. And so um, basically, we by 2003, by, by December of 2003, about two years after this global war on terrorism has started, we now have two insurgencies, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. And the one in Iraq went bad first. So Afghanistan, we beat them up pretty good the first round. It took them a while to reconstitute. But the reason they reconstituted is we're busy trying to stomp on this fire in Iraq. And so you say, you know, I get when I get to Afghanistan, we were only about a year and a half into President Obama's attempt to refocus on the war in Afghanistan because he said, hey, we've ignored this for 10 years while we handled this problem in Iraq. Seemed like Iraq was under control. It always seems like these things are. And that was just pre ISIS. ISIS would show up around 2014. But, you know, Abu al-Baghdadi, he was on my uh, target list when I was yeah. in command in Baghdad for the 1st Cavalry Division. He was one of the guys we were looking for. He'd been one of our enemies for a long time. ISIS came out of al-Qaeda in Iraq, so they'd been there the whole time. Hell, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was actually in our prison there at, at yes. Camp Luka for a while. We let him lose because he convinced us he was a, a low-level pipe swinger. Good job by him, but not too good for us. Um, so I don't mention, I just lay that out to remind us that President Obama puts us in. So when I get there in 2011 with the, the mission to help the Afghan security forces get squared away, we really only got about 18 months of effort on the ground at that point, because this has been the secondary effort. As yes. I joke with people who know the history of World War II, Afghanistan from about 2002 to about 2009 was the China-Burma-India theater in World yes. War II. I mean, it was it was of interest to the people there, but the average American was following what was going on in the Pacific and what was going on in Normandy. They, they didn't care about this business of this, what they saw as a secondary area. And so, um, we're, so we're trying to, to get this sorted out. And some things became very, very obvious. The first was the old British adage that, you know, you can't buy Afghan loyalty, but you could rent it. The, the, the Afghans who were joining the police and military were doing it basically for three hots and a cop. They had no, you know, they could care less about President Karzai, who was the president at the time. And I also know Ashraf Ghani Ahmed, Ashraf Ghani Ahmed, the guy who fled. Both Ghani and, and even more so Ghani than, than Karzai. When the Russians, when the Russians, when the, uh, when the average Afghan saw Ghani, I had him tell me this. The guys, when I'd be out on patrol with them, the Afghans would talk to you about stuff. And they're like, oh, Ghani, you know, they say he's an American. You know, he went to Columbia. Quick, fun, quick fun fact. He um, went to my high school. I'm from yeah, Lake Oswego, Oregon. He, he went, he spent a year at my high school. Um, yeah. That's so wild. That's a, that's a little fun fact. But well, please, there yeah. you go. And he taught at Berkeley, you know, Marshall. So. <laughs> Went to your high school. But to an Afghan, what they see with that guy is a guy who's cashed in with the foreign hand. You know, mm. that's the guy we decide, him and Karzai, Karzai, who also speaks impeccable English, spent a bunch of time in India. These are the two guys we think are great guys to run Afghanistan. They're the worst guys. I mean, the average Afghan looks at them and sees a toady, a collaborator. They're the Vichy French to the average Afghan, you know. Oh, wow. And so when we were, when we would be recruiting police and military, um, one of the things we had to do was teach them all how to read and write so that they could just do their job. Because, you know, and and look, I, I hear all this stuff on the news about, you know, the, the sophisticated American equipment we get. Their equipment is like Dick and Jane equipment. I mean, they got rifles, they got machine guns, they got trucks. I mean, the police are equipped with the same Ford truck you can go down and pick up at any used car lot. There's no sophisticated equipment. They have very little heavy artillery. They had a little tiny Air Force, but it, but it was unable to 
run without Americans there to fix it for them and stuff. So, so we shouldn't, we should, one thing we should not worry about, it's not like we gave these guys a bunch of Abrams tanks and a bunch of F-16. No, they don't have any of that kind of stuff. They, they got very little. But one of the things they didn't have when they would join up was the ability to read and write. So we would teach them that. You know, it's amazing it's for Saga Marshall and for the audience, I would just tell you, it's amazing. We were there for 20 years. We never put an emphasis on literacy for the average Afghan. Yeah, we do these spot programs where we'd educate women. We, we do a little thing at the university. We've had partnership program in robotics. All that's boutique screwing around. What we could have done in the villages that would have made a huge difference was a literacy push. Hmm. You realize if we would have taught those little Afghan first grader equivalents in about 2002 to read, those people, those men, men and women now who'd be adults, they realize that, that the Taliban is selling them a bunch of dreck and they shouldn't be buying it. Wasn't an emphasis. Our emphasis was, you know, build their military. And we define it, build their military, essentially, as getting numbers through the door. Well, you can get numbers and you can hand them an American M16 rifle and you can give them a Ford truck and you can do all those things. But the other thing that that army and police and Air Force counted on was their American and NATO partners. They were taught to fight side by side with us and be like us. And so as a result, when you pull away that side by side, it was like watching a balloon deflate. And that same thing happened, by the way, in Southeast Asia. In fact, I've heard a few people say, by the way, Marshall, before you jump in, I've heard a few people say, well, you know, the South Vietnamese held out for two years after the Americans left. We had a huge uh, military advisory component, millions and billions of dollars sent in of equipment. We left them with tanks, jets, all this kind of stuff. That two years they held out, they had a lot of American support. We didn't really cut the money for them till the spring of 1975. Hmm. With Afghanistan, we'd been weaning them down for years. And this by this year, they had no American allies, had, uh, advisors, partners, or anything. That's why they went under so quickly. So it would be the equivalent of if we had cut out the South Vietnamese in January 73 when President Nixon's people signed the accord with North Vietnam. But we did. We actually backed them for two more years. Yeah, hmm. Go ahead, Marshall. Yeah, I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like you to say something on behalf of of the soldiers of the former Afghan army, because I've every, everything I'm hearing you say suggests that we should not be too disparaging towards 18 or 20 year old Afghans who weren't willing to fight for any of these dynamics. So you, you get this rhetoric where people say, well, if they weren't willing to fight for their country, then that's kind of on them. And, and I'm not saying this to, that's just to support a continued presence in the country. I'm just hearing everything you're describing. And I'm thinking, wow, like this just wasn't a thing. That suggests there was a country to fight for. Uh, because to compare the South point. Vietnam, to compare the South Vietnam example and the Afghanistan example, say we want about South Vietnam, that was a country. That was a country. There was a it was a horrific military, and there's always civilian and military control issues, but there was actually a constituted company country, like the Army of the Republic of, you know, ARVN. I can't remember the exact act. Like that the was Army an actual Republic thing. Vietnam, that you're right, Arvin. I do not hear anything that could compare what the average Afghan soldier last week was experiencing that could compare to that experience. So I just I I just come away with a lot of sympathy. For, Af for, for Afghan soldiers. So I would just love to hear your perspective well, on, Marshall, that, on the dynamic. I'm glad you mentioned that because one thing that most of our folks here in our country should keep in mind, the Afghans, almost every year of the conflict that I was involved in, so once you get the U.S. surge and we go in with NATO in a big way during the Obama administration, like 2009 or so, the Afghan security forces every year took more dead and wounded than we did. In fact, the Afghan security forces since we drew down in 2014, each year until this year, had more dead and wounded than we've had in the entire war. So many, they were fighting. But for them, for you know, you got to put yourself in the perspective, as you said, an 18-year-old Afghan who's left home, trying to get three hots in a cot, trying to learn how to read and write. Um, he knows about protecting his family. He may know about protecting his village. Afghanistan is an abstract con concept. And when he thinks of it, he thinks of Ashraf Ghani, who's really an American wearing an Afghan shawis, you know, but he talks like an American, acts like an American, went to school in America. So he's not fighting for Ghani. He doesn't care about him or the other people in Kabul. He cares about the guys next to him, and you know, like most soldiers do. But um, 
But when he hears this year that the Americans are pulling the plug, in a lot of ways, he thinks to himself, all right, the only thing that's keeping body and soul together for me is the Americans. We paid their salaries, you know, and that's no small thing. We, we gave them their supplies like fuel and ammunition and all that stuff. You cut that stuff off and it's obviously cut off and it's publicly announced. Well, you know, every Taliban propagandist was sending the Americans have abandoned you. The Americans are cutting you off. The Amer- you won't get paid anymore. You won't get you won't get ammunition for your rifling. So what is a young guy to do? I think what a lot of them did is what we've seen in the last few months. They would fought fiercely for the last six or seven years. They've taken high losses. And you know what they say? If nobody's back and it's, it's time to start taking care of me and I'm going to go home to my village and I'm going to protect my family and the heck with Ghani and the other crooks in Kabul. And again, I don't. Yeah, you, you, it makes sense from a rational point of view. I don't blame what? the average Afghan soldier, but you know, and I'd like to, for you to speak to this: the senior commanders and the average government official were astoundingly corrupt um, in terms of every audit that our own government has done. John Sopko is somebody I've followed for a long time. Um, Me too. Has revealed- I, know, I know him very well. I, I respect the hell out of him. And he's actually one of the people who turned my own opinion on the Afghan war back in 2015, reading a lot of the reports that he wrote and his organization in terms of the rank corruption and the way that many of these you know, illiterate soldiers were used in order to line the pockets yes. of senior commanders and of senior government officials. So I, I don't want to let so many of the Afghans off the hook. I mean, Ashraf Ghani gave an interview May 17th, 2021, where he said, I will die for Afghanistan. He literally said, I would die for my country. And then he got on a helicopter full of cash and skipped town. Um, sure. the well, moment you know, of Taliban. That tells you what you can do with any statement by Ashraf Ghani. It always has, you know, the, the expiration date on it. Right. So, well, I'm curious. I, I would like for you to speak to that view because I think I, it's I knew many Afghan American field Americans commanders knows. who were competent. Um, and, and from what I can tell, some of them are still in the field. There, there are remnant areas that one of the things we aren't talking about is what's going to happen next. And we may get to that, but, um, mm-hmm. the Taliban is going to have an insurgency on their hands. I can tell you that the Tajiks, Taliban is primarily a Pashtun movement. The Tajiks, Uzbek, Hazara people are not going to play along with this very long. The Turkmen, the, the Nuristanis, the various minorities in, in Afghanistan, They'll give the Taliban a couple months, but when they don't get what they want, they'll go into revolt. A lot of these, these colonels and majors and sergeants major who were the key fighters, you know, look, and it's the same in the United States. Nobody in the Pentagon wins a war. They're nice people, but the war is won at the front by sergeants and by junior guys. It was the same in Afghanistan. And those people, to include the field commander types, and I've followed some of their names, they're all still out there. And they have pulled the same thing the Taliban did in 0102. They've gone to ground, they hid their uniforms, they put the AK-47 or the M-16 under the bunk, and they're going to wait and see what happens. And then they will begin the insurgency. And the Taliban was tangling with an insurgency. When they took over in 96, they had an insurgency going that we jumped on. Oh, yeah, for years, Canada. all the way until the Northern the Alliance, Amish, right. Amish. Absolutely. You know, you know. Well, those guys aren't going away. And they have the younger generation as well. Um, many of those guys, and frankly, for a lot of them, they're going to be in their element. They never like too much putting on the uniform and fighting American style, but, but bushwhacking, they love that. That's what they mm. do. And so that, and that's how they, they protect their families. So uh, we are going to see that. And, and I think it goes to, you know, the corrupt crooked guys in Kabul that get out and terrible, well, you know, and it's, it's horrible that it was that way, but you're exactly right. They're, they're one of the most corrupt countries in history. And we, we knew that, you know, you mentioned John Sapko, I respect the heck out of him and his his SIGAR team, his special inspector general for Iraq for Afghanistan reconstruction. There was also one in Iraq, by the way, that found horrible things. But the the Afghan case was worse. I respect him, but you know what was sad? He was Cassandra. He was yeah. prophesying, and no one was listening to him. I actually sat in meetings with our ambassador and embassy team, with our senior military, and they'd go, "Oh yeah, John's having to go find X, Y, and Z." But you know, he's always complaining. It's like. He's showing you what's going on. You know, you can keep saying, hey, it's not, you know, it's not this way, but it is this way. So something I'm wondering, especially as you tell the history of the post-Vietnam era, I wonder what should folks who are either in the military 
want to join the military, the Captain H.R. McMasters of today, what should they do with all of this? Because a key thing that needs to be said in defense of our generals and, you know, such as yourself and the military is that we live in a civilian led country. So right. you can, to Sagar, your point about generals saying no more Vietnams, that's great. But Ronald yeah, Reagan could say right. Ronald Reagan could say something entirely different. Ronald Reagan could have said, "Well, now it's time to go into Cambodia, or now it's time to do this, do this, do Absolutely. that." It's not actually up to the military. And we just got—I don't want to say lucky because that was, I think, something that George H. W. Bush should be cited for. Desert Storm was a war that had excellent political objectives. The military capacity was there. The coalition was there. That was just the apex post World War II defense of our system and how it can work. But my point is, what I really wonder is, you could say we're never going to do Vietnam again, but 30 years later, everything repeats itself in a history rhymes type of way. So what do you just suggest that folks in the military or folks who are civilians or interested in the defense policy, national security side, what should they take from this? What should, what should they do to actually think about all of this? Because once again, we could have had the same conversation in 1977, and it wouldn't have actually changed the underlying dynamics. Mm -hmm. I, I think the big thing, Marshall, that that you have to do is you have to honestly look at what we did. In other words, you yes, you want to honor the men and women who fought there. They did a great job. Heroism. Same thing in Vietnam. No lack of heroism or skill and the hooking and jabbing fighting part. Well done. But the strategy is messed up in, in both Vietnam and in this global war on terrorism. That's got to be looked at with a clear, clear eye. And it's got, and we have to hold ourselves accountable. One of the great things that happened after Vietnam and all the services, the armed services, and it also happened in the Department of State, and it also happened in the CIA and the other parts of the intelligence community, there was a reckoning. People said, what were the lessons of what we just did? Right. One of the worst things that could happen right now in this situation, we're being given an opportunity to examine ourselves. I would love to see the current administration appoint a board, a blue ribbon panel, get the right people on it. John Sopko would be a guy I'd definitely have on this as a witness, as a minimum, if not a member. Get a panel of these wise men and women and say, what the heck just happened? The British did it for their operations in Iraq with the Chillicote report and board. And that's an excellent archive. It shows what happened. Um, we need that because you're exactly right. We're going to be faced with other insurgent situations. Uh, from a military perspective, I can tell you the solution to the insurgent situation. Sorry, sir. I just, want to, I just want to say something to pin for audience members, because the key thing is that in the wars we are describing, we did not start out saying, hey, let's go wage a counterinsurgency. That's the key thing. We didn't say that's the whole thing of Vietnam. We weren't, you know, we didn't wake up when the French left the country and said, hey, it's time to go fight a guerrilla war. That happened. The same thing with Afghanistan and Iraq. So I just Absolutely. really, it's a really important point to note, but please continue. Yeah, exactly right. You, you tend to back into guerrilla wars. No, no major power wants to fight a guerrilla war because the challenge is if your enemy's at all competent, you're going to be in a protracted war where the best outcome is a stalemate and likely a defeat. So um, what I was going to mention is when we face this situation, it may happen again. Like you said, we intervene in country X and it degenerates into a guerrilla war. Here's the important thing to remember. And I say this haven't been, been in, on the advisory side and one of my tours in Iraq and also in my only tour in Afghanistan for a year and a half. What you got to realize at that point is it's their war. And so you have to go into the advisory mode. Yes, you use some air support, some logistics, some, um, you know, some intelligence support from America and our allies, but it's their war. I, I would tell you, had we done that, fine. But what did we do instead? In both countries, we had troop surges, which put in more Americans to fight the war. Look, if I'm an Iraqi or an Afghan, I look next to me and I say, why should I fight this war? I got the best army in the world fighting war for me. You. And I mean, that only makes sense. It's the Americans with the French and the French in the American Revolutionary War. Once the French show up, we let them lead the major assaults at Yorktown and stuff, because why? They're better troops than us. But, but, the, but I think that's the deal. We need to take a clear-eyed look at this and realize strategically, if anybody comes to a U.S. president and gives he or she the advice, put a large number of ground forces, American, into a counterinsurgency, throw them the heck out of the room like yesterday. That is not an answer. 
I mean, and I, speaking as a guy who's trying to be a history professor right now, I can tell you that is a lesson. It's sort of like don't invade Russia in winter. You know, it's one of those things. Just don't do it. And yet, sir, the, the current crop, as far as I can tell, are telling our current president, our past president and the president before him exactly that. But that's a story for another day. I want to finish with uh, uh, really a discussion around and bring it back to what you said around China and Taiwan, because I've, I've seen the same thing. All these takes. Oh, the Chinese are now going to invade Taiwan. And I'm like. Yeah, the Chinese are going to look at a pullout from an insurgency and extrapolate that they're going to win a thermonuclear exchange in a ground war with air, like air to air combat, exactly in a uniform mission. That they would be the dumbest people of all time. I respect them far more than to think that they would be so dumb in order to do that. Or, you know, the Russians taking over Ukraine. It's the same thing. I mean, or not in Ukraine, a real NATO nation, like a, a, a member nation within NATO, Estonia or something. No, like tanks are not rolling into Tallinn tomorrow. That would be crazy. So can you just actually just speak once again to yeah. the, what the military is actually good at? Because, look, there are a lot of people who are military listening to this podcast. I've had a lot of service members reach out to me, um, thanking me for my, you know, my position at least on resolutely supporting the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I, I don't want us to take away the, you know, I don't want us to take away the lesson that we're, we have a terrible military. We just use them for something they were not designed to right. do. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. It's like, it's like, you know, essentially saying, you know, all I've got is a rake and I want to mow the lawn. The rake is not going to mow the lawn. You know I mean? You got to use tools for what they're intended for. The military tool of the United States is largely designed for conventional warfare. So back to our Taiwan, China thing. I would tell you right now, you mentioned thermonuclear weapons. Since 1945, there's been no nuclear war. No, no major power. Now would some crazy terrorists who gotta use it? Possibly, because they, they're not thinking straight. But no major power that wants regime survival in that communist Chinese party, that is number one goal, is survival mm -hmm. of the control of the communist Chinese party, Chinese communist party. But, but they're not going to take a risk with a, with a nuclear armed power. Our Navy has been only peripherally involved in these global wars on terrorism. Our Air Force has been more involved, but they, a lot of their parts have not. Our deterrent forces you know, are as strong as ever. And this was a big lesson from 1975. You know, you, you know, there were attempts by Moscow in 1975 to, to do things in the developing world. What it turned out for them is they just went in and got burned in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, in the, in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and most notably in Afghanistan. You know, to a degree, one of the things that the Americans would, would benefit from would be if the Chinese were stupid enough to militarize their Belt and Road and get involved in a bunch of these, these brush fire wars, because they'd find they'd have the same problem that we did. You know, they also are a conventional force. And, and you know, the days of the Mao Zedong guerrillas are long over. Just like the Russians thinking they can relive the, the glory days of the Civil War. You know, not going to happen once you get that conventional buildup. And the de nuclear deterrent force is going to prevent it. I, I agree with you, Sag. We've got a great military because of the men and women in it. We have to support them. And it's particularly important right now, something we haven't talked about today, but we should keep in mind. We've got to do this extraction right. We've got all, all, up to about 6,000 Americans right now in a very precarious spot. Um, near the, the Kabul airport. And uh, we got to get our people out and we got to not mess around with that mission. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. This is really, really helpful. And I hope that the listeners really took your definitions and your framework seriously, because once again, we're going to be in some similar type situation 15 20 years from now, we can't over cyclicize history, but that is just something that history happens. We're not going to say, hey, it's time to democratize the world again. That's never how this works. There will be a new problem, a new situation, things will escalate, and it's really going to be at that meeting that you're describing around when someone comes with a plan that this is really going to come down for. So the last just really obvious question, could you please shout out any work? I know you recently published a, a book on World War II. So please shout out. Um, obviously, um, you've been writing not just since 2014. You're prolific. So we'd, love to, yeah. we'd love to hear a quick uh, shout out to that. Uh, yes, I've been very fortunate. I've, I've had the chance to write. You know, people think the military is sometimes they think we're a bunch of knuckle draggers, but they actually do encourage you to think and write and stuff like that. 
Um, yeah, my latest book is called The Panzer Killers. It's about the Third Armored Division of the U.S. Army fighting in World War II, that conventional warfare stuff, regular war, mm -hmm. um, fighting the Germans in World War II. It came out in May, and uh, it's available everywhere, most notably through Penguin, who is the publisher, but also right. Amazon has it. I'm, by this time, heck, the, the local grocery store may have it. I don't know, because it's supposed <laughs> to be coming out in paperback pretty soon. We'll, we'll have links to all of those down in our description. So Thank we you. appreciate Thank you joining you us, much. sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. 